I was back. All right, so leave. I am responding to Chloe Jacqueline. Uh, basically, I made a response, and um, it's just kind of getting this channel off the ground, and the audio messed up on it, and like I didn't really want to do it again because I hate redoing stuff. Um, but sometimes you have to. I, you know, I've got one video where I explain the gospel very thoroughly according to the scripture. That one I had to do over again. And, you know, basically he's like, well, maybe God don't want you. No, God wants you to <laughs> spread the gospel. So, basically I made a response to this girl. Uh, she seemed, honestly, she seemed like a sweet girl, you know, uh, seemed to love the Bible and stuff like that. But, uh, basically... You know, a lot of times people can get um, spiritual, and yet they've not been sticking very strongly to Scripture. Now, I'm going to point this out, and I think this is the case with her, but it's not that I'm saying that, you know, you can always go to this, or this explains, you know, why everybody holds this doctrine. I'm not saying that, but... It, I do kind of feel like there's a situation here, and so I'll start here. This is in 2 Timothy, or is it 1 Timothy? Mm, I think it's 1 Timothy. I'll say that now. Oh, I'm on 2 Timothy. <laughs> All right. It says, um, let the woman, let's see here, yeah, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, not, sorry, but I suffer not a woman, that's, I'm on uh, 1 Timothy 2.12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Eve, sorry, and Adam, verse 14, was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Okay, and it talks about uh, her being saved, childbearing, and stuff like that. Basically, um, it is true that women, uh, due to their nature that God created with them, uh, they can be taken up by spiritual forces. They can be easily deceived. And women with very uh, good intentions can be deceived at times. And uh, basically, I think that this girl, uh, you know, uh, has been deceived. And, you know, some people with the best intentions. I, I believe she probably has the best intentions in the world. But she is totally fooled by that guy. And what kind of spirit am I talking about of deception? Well, let's look over here in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. It says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, basically, the discussion is over the rapture and... Um, whether there's a pre-trib rapture or do we have to go through the wrath of the tribulation... Now, um, basically, this is a spirit of legalism that overtakes a lot of the people in this camp. If you are from an evangelical background and you've been taught very thoroughly about how we're saved by grace through faith, you might end up holding to this, but yet it doesn't take away from what you've already previously been discipled with over the years. Okay? But... If you just are, you know, new to faith and you're walking into that theology and assuming, well, we have to go through the wrath of God, the tribulation, 
your assumptions are going to lead you to workspace salvation and the demon of legalism, the demon of bondage, the spirit of bondage that was talked about in Romans 8. So the majority of the cult world, the world of those who dis mess with the Bible and then think they can work their way to heaven through their specific group of people, the cult world holds to post-tribulationalism. Okay, and so this is what you get. They're not looking forward to the blessed hope of Jesus. Okay, now in the Bible, when I'm thinking eschatology, eschatology is both the afterlife and the end times. But when we think about heaven, okay, I as a Baptist who takes the Bible literally I look directly forward to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. And so when I think of the end times, I'm thinking of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I am happy that there is good news. And I'm looking forward to what's called in scripture the blessed hope. So I'm happy about the coming of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who's going to save me. I'm not going to get saved. I'm not, you know, like she makes an accusation, which is very bizarre. And she says that, you know, you're trying to get to Jesus through the rapture. No, rapture means harpazo to be caught up. Okay. I'm not flying. I'm being taken. Okay. It is a harpazo. It is the rapture. I'm being taken and snatched up by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm not going through this thing. I'm not marching through this. I'm not trying to merit anything. I don't even have to try. It's in the blink of an eye. Okay? So it's impossible to try to act like you're working through the rapture. On the opposite end, she talks about this as this time of purification. This goes directly into, you know, one thing we have talked about uh, in the community of pre-tribbers, you know, there's been the argument about um, Protestant purgatory. And Protestant purgatory is where we have uh, this purification that our salvation is somehow not good enough. And so we have this purification in the end times. And so basically um, the wrath of God on us, apparently the merit of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ was not enough. I mean, that's the only answer. Okay. You have some wrath. No, your sins were not covered. Jesus' blood was not good enough. No, I mean, and this is the thing, there's that connection, okay, and the eschatology connects to heaven, it connects to the end times for a reason, okay, because everything's moving into this, heaven is moving into this, okay, and so in Romans 5, in terms of, you know, the basics of salvation, it says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. He will save us from the wrath of God. And you say, no, 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 you didn't do it good enough. You were doing something wrong. You weren't praising God right. You, you, you just, you're despicable. No, I am righteous. You know why I am righteous? Because the blood of Jesus Christ has been imputed upon me. It's stamped upon me. It's covered me up. As he said earlier in Romans, and that is Romans chapter 3. Um, starting verse um, 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So many of the law keeping cults are really on this. They're really attacking the rapture hard and their theology bleeds black and forth. Their theology goes back and forth across this stuff. Okay. The salvation and the eschatology is put right together. And basically... You know, going back here, though, it says no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. All the law could tell you is that you're a sinner and you deserve the wrath of God. He says, but now, hold on, something new. And he says, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the prophets. There is a righteousness that is alien to what's inside of me. Okay. And that is the righteousness that is Jesus Christ. 
It's his righteousness, okay? Not mine, but it's his righteousness. And he says, verse 22, this is Romans 3, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Okay? And there is no difference for all sin to come short of the glory of God. But, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, which whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, which is covering that wrath, okay? And it says, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, therefore, sorry, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth, that means all believers. Where is their boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And yet, when you look at the tribulation period, and you look at these martyrs, they keep the commandments of God. Okay? The martyrs of the tribulation, they keep the commandments of God. And this is all talking about Israel. So then what do these people conclude? Oh, well, we're all Israel now. So if you're all Israel now, then you're all under the, the law. And if you're under the law, guess what? You're not getting saved by that law. All that law is telling you, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Okay? If you are coming to God and I'm saying, I'm clothed in self-righteous legalism. Then all you're saying is, the law is telling you, you are condemned. And you have this shirt that says... Who's condemned for sin? This guy. Who's going to hell? This guy. Okay. That's all it is. It's just a big sign on your shirt. You are clothed in damnation. This guy. Okay. So basically, you have to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is alien from you because you do have no righteousness. Paul said, I count it all but filthy rags. He also said, I count it all but dung. Okay. Poo poo. Okay, that's what that's what your work is. Okay, your work is nasty. You are nasty. You are covered in sin. You have no ability to throw that stuff up there. Okay, and I don't care what kind of tribulation or torture you go through. You will never scrape the stain of sin off of you. You need it to be covered over. You need to be painted over. Okay, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it can wash you white as snow. Okay. Um, let's see some things right here real quick. Uh, she talked about, didn't really, you know, there's not a lot of reading here, so I want to kind of look at this stuff. And let's see here, where are we at? It says, um, verse 51, or let's go to verse 50 of 1 Corinthians. He says, now this I say. Brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Hold on. If you're going through the tribulation, you got to survive. So you got to take your nasty flesh to inherit the kingdom of God. No. You can't do it. Okay? You got to take the Bible literally. Okay? And so it says. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. All right, go and look at your tribulation passages. Okay, Show where, during the tribulation... There's all these Old Testament saints that are just sitting up there in the air who have risen from the dead. Where is it? Okay. When you have the rapture, the saints are all merged together, the old and the new, and everybody's ready and they all went to heaven. Okay. But where is, if that's not supposed to happen... Okay, then where is this resurrection of the dead saints that happens before Jesus collects everybody else? Okay, he's supposed to come through and, you know, uh, post-tribulational, 
uh, Jesus is supposed to, in the second coming, have all these angels gather people. But then he's supposed to gather people. Okay? The, you have to have this order. Okay? Where is this, you know, post-trib? Especially if you guys are, what was it? Um, Pre-wrath. Okay? Pre-wrath rapture. Shouldn't they, if they're raptured in the middle or the pre-wrath, shouldn't there be the dead in Christ hanging out with them? And what are they going to do? Okay, where, where are they going to go? I mean, they were already dead. All right. Um, you know, there's just a lot of mass confusion there. And he says, so it's like, this is quick. All right. Um, for the trumpet shall sound, then the rest will be... We shall all be changed. Verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass. And the saying is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. That sounds pretty good. Death is gone right? Okay what about the millennium? Isaiah, I think it was like somewhere between 16 and 65, 66. There is people who die in the millennial period. And there's going to be a battle at the end of the millennium. So, how on earth, and I've done a video on the millennium. I'll probably put it as a reference or something like that. But this is talking about, you know, among pre-tribbers or among pre-millennials. Uh, who's going to enter the millennium? If everybody is changed, okay, all right, everybody's just there in one group the whole time, then who's going to be able to make um, babies that die? Where are people capable of death during the millennium? Because in that post-trip scenario, now everybody's supposed to be gathered together, you know, there's no tribulation saints, Jews, or anything like that. We're all just one big body, and now we've all been made immortal. So, where are the mortals going to be coming during this time? Okay. Let me show you again here. This is Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, says this. Eve, it says, for the mystery of iniquity, and that would be, I would interpret that as the spirit of the Antichrist, doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be out of the way. Now, there's an antithesis between the Antichrist spirit and the Holy Spirit, and you can find that in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Remember, that's the letter, okay, the epistle, 1 John 4, 1 through 3. And it says, uh, until he be taken out of the way. So until the Holy Spirit be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay. Um, he says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, see that, with all the power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the truth, that they might be saved. So everybody in the tribulation period who did not accept the gospel, okay, is going to be condemned to hell. It is a trap for unbelievers. It is not for them to get saved, okay? It's not like a second chance. If you have rejected the gospel, with the Holy Spirit pulling at your heart, then how are you going to accept the gospel with the Holy Spirit out of the way? Okay? It's just not going to happen. All right? And so now here is that deception. Okay? And we're saying, well, you know, God's, you know, purifying you. Right, Chloe? You, either God's purifying you and is going to see if you got any righteousness. Well, you don't. Ta-da! So you don't have any internal righteousness. It's going to get you through this. Okay. You're going to be condemned. All right. So what does he say? He says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. God is coming after you, sending you strong delusion. How's he going to save you? <laughs> He's not wanting to save you. Okay. And he loves and wants to save his bride. Okay. 
And he says uh, that they all might be damned, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is Second Thessalonians 2.12. Um, now, well, I might, let me throw in this. I know I'm just trying to sum, thumb, sum things up, because I know that, like, you know, we're not talking about some Bible scholar war. We're talking just about, you know, believers who have some honest feelings about stuff. But, I mean, this is a fight, though. I mean, just honestly, the way she's going it with things, you know, and this is where they go. They always have this anger, and they want to fight because of the spirit of legalism. That spirit of bondage, okay? They want to attack. You know, they're not coming to you saying, yeah, Jesus is coming, and we're so excited about it, you know. They're like, he's going to get you. He's going to get you. Let me tell you about the hate of Jesus. <laughs> you know, it, that's that spirit that's welling up in them. It's taking them over, okay. But Second Thessalonians, or no, we go back to First Thessalonians. It says, um... For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, this is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, 4, died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus the dead will, will God bring with them. For this we say unto you, that the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and then Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Okay, so in other words... Um, how do you feel comforted? Okay, the word comfort. You get relieved. Okay. If someone's going to come and break down your door right now and shoot you in the head and rape your family and, you know, steal all your stuff and burn your house down, are you feeling relief as you approach that? See, don't worry, there'll be things after. But first things first, get ready for that. And when you get ready for the bullets to come flying at your face, are you feeling comforted? No. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's not rational. Okay. And what does it say? Let's see here. And it says, um, we go all the way back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which hath delivered us from the wrath to come. There is coming future wrath. And what did Jesus do? He delivered us. We're waiting for him. We're not waiting for wrath. Okay. Because why? Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Okay. Let's go to Revelation. All right. Now, people take this and they pick it apart without looking at the whole thing. Okay. Now, let's see here. First place I go. Let's just go look here at, I believe it was 310. He's, he's talking to the Church of Philadelphia. And, well, we'll go... Um, We'll go to verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Okay, and this is that end times thing for the believer. He says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, Chloe, she was saying that, no, everybody's going to go through it. Okay, that's rational. <laughs> all right. It didn't make any sense. Okay, there have been people for 500 years now saying, it's coming. It's really here. Okay, no man knows there the hour when the Lord comes. And if you're a preacher of relationist, you know it, okay? It all makes sense when you know that. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man make 
may man take thy crown okay this is a reward and hold on to jesus and there is a reward okay that you are not going through the tribulation okay you're keeping you're being kept from that hour well then we go over and then john has his experience after this i looked and behold a door was open in heaven and the first voice which i heard as it were of a trumpet rapture the trumpet the call and that goes back to the book of numbers where it talks about you blowing the horns and here comes the army and bring the army over here get everybody together okay so the call happens the blast happens and that's our end times if you're a gentile okay if you are going through the tribulation the tribulation was something called the time of jacob's trouble it was the 70 weeks of daniel it is something for Israel because the church wasn't there yet because Jesus set up the church. So it says, I look, the door was open in heaven and the voice which I heard as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, snatched up, say, come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now, don't get me wrong. You could argue if you isolate that passage. It's just John. What are you talking about, Matt? Start putting this stuff together, though, okay? You have that pre-trib promise, and you're like, well, that was the Church of Philadelphia. Well, hold on, buddy. Let's go back here. And it says, verse 13. Remember we read verse 10? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, plural. Okay, so now you have this promise of deliverance from the coming wrath. And about six different times tribulation is called the wrath of God. Okay, and we know that we're delivered from the wrath to come. But now we build on to this. And now, okay, he called and you heard the horn and all of a sudden John's taken up to heaven. Okay. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was, sorry, and he that sat, as he was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was rainbow round about the throne, and the sight like an a, unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw the four and twenty elders, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, they had crowns of gold. They were all together. They've already received the rewards of judgment. But then you're going to read, you know, about 12 chapters talking about the tribulation and the wrath of God. And on top of it, you know, about what, 10, 20 times you heard like churches, 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 church, 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 and then... All of a sudden, you're not going to see church being used in the rest of Revelation. Except maybe at the very end after Jesus came back and set up everything and all that kind of stuff. So what's going on here is that that's taking care of issues with Israel in order to bring Israel back to the faith. And Israel's going to get saved and that's going to be great. Okay. But going back to it here, we've already received our rewards. We've been in and out already. Okay, judgment starts at the house of God. We already got it. So there is an end. There is a judgment for us. And then you're going to have things where we're coming back from the wedding feast and all that kind of stuff. All right. And there's other scriptures that talk about that. I did a three-part series, and maybe I'll tag this on the end. But, yes, basically, um, we are looking forward to the coming of Christ. We are under grace. All right. And when it comes to all that other stuff, all right, it has to be taken care of by Jesus Christ. There are things in this physical life where the penalty of sin is death, okay? I'm not taking that away. And another thing, it is a lie. It is a demonic lie to say that the pre-trib rapture means that you never have to go through trouble. Nobody argues that. Closest thing, I think I saw once... Um, Oh, the guy in, in charge of TBN or whatever. I think he said something like that once. But honestly, uh, most people who are understanding the end times would label him a heretic. Okay? A dispensationalist. We, they, they, they do. They, they don't, <laughs> you know, Paul, what's his name? You know, they, they don't really treat him as, 
you know, one of them. So that is not generally the teaching, okay? Everybody knows that you could die, all right? But just that you could die doesn't mean you're facing the wrath of God, and you're not going to face the wrath of God if you've been saved. So we'll see you later.